Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and delighted that we have this time together with Rhonda Stoppe, the No Regrets Woman, who appears here on the first Wednesday of every month at the 12 o'clock hour to host the No Regrets Hour. With more than 30 years of experience as a marriage mentor, pastor's wife, Author and speaker, Rhonda leads women of all ages to live a life of no regrets. Using sound biblical teaching through humor and honest communication, she teaches women how to apply God's Word to live boldly through the power of the Holy Spirit. She's appeared on radio programs, spoken at women's events, mops groups, and homeschool conventions across the nation. She's the author of Moms Raising Sons to Be Men, which mentors thousands of moms to guide sons to a no-regrets life the author of If My Husband Would Change and Other Myths That Wives Believe. Uh, I'm sorry, If My Husband Would Change, I'd Be Happy and Other Myths Wives Believe, and Real Life Romance, Helping Countless Women Build No Regrets Marriage. They are, she is also the co-author with her husband, Steve, of The Marriage Mentor. She lives in California with her husband. They have four adult children, eight grandchildren, and here to host the No Regrets Hour is our special friend, Rhonda Stoppy, welcome to the No Regrets Hour. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Uh, <laughs> very happy to see you. Uh, and you. Uh, delighted to have you on the program. So what and is life? Update. We have, ten, we have 10 grandkids now. 10. 10, ten grandkids. All right. I am going to fix we this. In, we had one born in July, and then my daughter, Kayla, had a baby uh, the week before Thanksgiving. And oh. so now we have 10. That's eight granddaughters and two grandsons. <laughs> wow. Wow. And, Lots of and tool and crowns and fluff around our house. Right. Now, I know I've seen Steve dress up and I've seen him play with the girls. Uh, I know he's looking forward to the boy parts of uh, raising up his grandsons and uh, looking for them to be uh, as much of tractor riders and tractor lovers as the girls have been. Yes, yes. Uh, the one that lives in Southern California, he's two, and his favorite thing with Papa is quad ride, quad ride. <laughs> and so they take off on the quad, get away from all this glitter and glamour in the house where the girls are playing dress up. I did get Ledger some pirate outfits and some stuff, so when the girls are dressing up, at least he has a direction to go, and then he gets to be the, the fun pirate. <laughs> so what does this massive family, so four adult children with all, all are married, so that's eight, plus the yeah. 10, that's 18, plus you and Steve, that's 20. And yeah. what do you all do? Uh, and how do you, as the no regrets woman, manage what other people struggle with during the holidays his family dynamics. This one wants to use grandma's recipe. This one wants to use this recipe. This one has this is their tradition. And if we don't do it this way, they're upset. And if we don't open the presents in this order, and if we don't draw the numbers this way, it's always somebody somewhere that's got some idea which kind of goes against the grain. How have you been able to strike this perfect harmony? within the stoppy household perfect harmony <laughs> <laughs> you know we just kind of chill we just kind of enjoy being together uh, i was telling you before we came on the air that we don't celebrate christmas on christmas with the whole family uh, my husband's in ministry we always do a christmas eve service uh, brandon's in ministry in southern california they do a christmas eve service so when you're in ministry you work on christmas pretty much <laughs> Uh, I have another son-in-law who is a police officer, and usually the holidays are not going to be available for him. We have another son who's a fighter pilot in the Air Force. So Christmas just is never the day that we can actually get together. And they all have their own families, the, the in-laws, that they can spend that holiday with, too. So we just pick a day, usually after the first of the year, that everyone can be together, come up to the ranch and hang out. And it's usually just pretty chill. We just kind of don't do a whole lot except hanging out and uh, the kitchen's open to whoever wants to bake their favorite thing or whatever. Uh, and I enjoy it very much. And I know, again, like we talked about before, 
the woman that I am, the woman that I would be is so different because of Christ in me, the hope of glory. Uh, the, the stress and the chaos that could be easily me imposing on my family the things that I want because I want it the way I want it. Uh, I'd be the I'd be the rub. <laughs> I'd be the one that would would probably stress everybody out. But you know, Rhonda, you've struck on something that's really kind of interesting. Part of this pushing everybody together at one time on a specific date <clears throat> and accommodating the in-laws and the battles and all that by yielding to all of that and letting them all go their own directions to satisfy all of the demands of tradition, the way the uh, wife's family did it, the way, and they get to do that, then they get to come to you after all of the um, stresses and stressors are already dealt with. Maybe the wisdom in the way you do it is what makes it so that it's a, not a pressure cooker it's not an agenda driven. It's really just a joyful time of gathering, which is exactly what it's supposed to be. But people have made so much of it and demand so many specific things. And as uh, parents age and they want to make sure that they honor those traditions and raise their children with those traditions, it seems like they are more focused on family traditions and whether or not it's ham or it's turkey or it's goose or it's turducken or it's some uh, odd combination thereof, you do it where it's family-focused, but it's also Christ-focused. That's the center point. And I found over the years, <clears throat> and it's one of the reasons that I confess that I don't go. Uh, I get a number of invitations and I conveniently have other, I just say, well, I'll, I'll, I'll make a decision on that day. And I watch the families and I don't see as much of Jesus in the celebration as I see the presents and the distractions and the electronics and the the herding of cats and just this whole um, notion that it's about this event that's surrounding a much greater event, but the much greater event gets to be in the shadows of the chaos of the family gathering and the event. And maybe it's a simple matter of we've taken Christ out of Christmas. Do you think that might I think, be a little bit of I that? think it's easy to get wrapped up in it. I'm a gift giver. I love, love buying presents for, and my, my daughters and daughters-in-law are like, we have too many toys. <laughs> I'm like, you have too many kids. They need toys. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear it. I have a rooster on my porch that is just crowing its little head off. I can't do anything about that. Sorry, I'm at the ranch today. This is this is live, so you know, live live is live. Live is live. I'm, yeah, I'm surprised. It would be more chaotic if I went and tried to run him off. Yeah, I'm surprised a peacock doesn't run by the camera. So you know, and it could happen. Make it happen. But I think for uh, for any family, I think it's just realizing. You know, we don't sit around and, you know, sing hymns and be all spiritual. It's the year long of just pressing into your love for Christ. It's not just one day that you go, oh, okay, we have to think about Jesus now. As, as we continue to pursue him, you know, Jesus said the priority of life in Mark chapter 12 is to love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's your whole being. When we decide, I can't do that on my own. I will love me better than anyone else every time because that's where I go for my idolatry is how can I be comfortable? How can I be happy? That's who I am when I'm not walking in the spirit, when I'm not pursuing a holy life. So if we are living all year long, asking God, search me, know my heart, try me, know my anxious thoughts, see if there's any wicked way in me, lead me in the way everlasting. If we're living like that throughout the year, then that one day that you all come together, it's not a forced suck it up. Everybody's got to get along because if, if the first commandment is loving Christ with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, 
the second command God made was to love your neighbor as yourself. But I can't love others selflessly unless my love for Christ is what is the priority of my life. Because then Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Then his love spills out of us onto others. And we're able to just agree to disagree or we're able to just, you know, honor someone else's wishes or do it their way instead of your way. Uh, you know, control freaks, raise freaks. There's a whole section in my book, Moms Raising Sons to Be Men, about that. There's also a section called People Pleasing Isn't Pleasing because a lot of times the holidays come and that's where we all go back into our extended families. The people pleaser will, you know, become that middle child again that tries to please everybody or whatever. The control freak will try harder to manipulate and control everyone to get it to be the way they want it to be. Uh, so, yeah, it's not just saying, okay, this is Christmas. We're all going to treat each other like Jesus wants us to. I think it's just praying for my kids, which I've always prayed for them, that they would love God more than they love anyone else in this life, that their love for God would be their priority, and that love would spill over into their spouses and onto their children and even onto us as their parents. You know, you bring up a very good point that this is a lifelong, year-long pursuit. And, and celebration of Christ. And, and celebration. And it seems that we glorify certain events and we act a certain way during those events or during those seasons that kind of is a revelation to me that if you can be nice and you can be accommodating one day of year, then I know that you're capable of it. And should that not become the pattern for your behavior for the rest of the year, as opposed to it being your best behavior one day a year, and you're just going to act out the way you want for the other 364? The difference is I can fake it for one day out of the year. I can pretend not to be a difficult person or be self-centered or be manipulative. It's easy for a person to just decide that one day I'm going to hold my tongue, uh, but it's not real. It's a hypocritical way. And if your kids are watching, you know, the number one thing that drives Christian kids away from Christ when they're growing up in a Christian home is the hypocrisy that they see in their, in their Christian parents. So you can make yourself be, you know, okay for the day, but the Bible says iron sharpens iron. And when we live in community with others and we get bumped, sparks fly when we rub up against others, but out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And sometimes when we're in that uh, bad rat experiment of everyone being together at the same time for an extended period of time and we get bumped, that's a time Christ shows us our own selfish heart or our own uh, tendency to control, our own need to uh, feel needed or to feel like, uh, you know, honored or whatever the thing is that comes up during those holidays. So it's not a bad thing that we come together with family as much as if we let it be, okay, God, I just realized my response was so self-absorbed or so not Christ-like. So I can blame everybody else, which is what people do. But truly, let it begin with you. Let it begin with me. God, how do you want me to live in a manner worthy of my calling? How do you want me to shine Christ brightly so that my kids or my grandkids are drawn to want to know my Savior? Not because uh, I make the best um, tr Christmas cookies or everything is just perfect at Grandma's house. Another thing that's kind of interesting as a grandmother, too, um, and actually, Steve was in youth ministry for 18 years before he was a senior pastor. And we had youth group at our house. We had 200 teenagers at our house every Wednesday night when we planted a church in Austin, Texas. White carpet, white furniture. It, it was destroyed. We fed them hot dogs every week. <laughs> but our mantra, mine and Steve's mantra, was people over possessions. And I think if Grandma's house is going to be a place all the kids are going to come, uh, you might want to put away anything that you don't want to get broken. You might want to just make it a place that they can just enjoy being at grandma and grandpa's house. Or, you know, if you're the aunt or the mom or whoever, just enjoy it. doesn't mean we don't train our kids not to break things. We always did it. It was called one finger touch with our little ones because they're curious how something feels. So they could one finger touch the, the ornaments on the tree or they could one finger touch things. And that was a good, you know, compromise to, you know, their curiosity was, was, uh, it's the word appeased, um, and yet teaching them self-restraint. Don't grab it. Just one finger touch it. So as a mom, if you're going to your mother's-in-law house and she doesn't put everything away, then 
don't make it be her fault that things get broken. That's when you get to say, okay, kids, grandma's got some really special things. And before you get there, practice one finger touch or practice. We're not going to touch grandma's special things and explain this would be really heartbreaking to grandma if you broke that because it was a treasure from her mom or, you know, whatever, uh, teaching them to respect where they're going. Does that all make sense? Well, it makes a lot of sense. And I think that, that, uh, uh, you know, you don't start out with 20 grandchildren. You start out with one child, and you begin the process early on in developing how you're going to raise those children. This is the whole point of your mom's raising sons to be men, is that you start early on in the process. If you want them to get a Proverbs 31 woman, they've got to become a Proverbs 31 man. And they have to understand the importance of things and when you yield and when you, when you, when you lead by uh, leading and when you lead by cooperating and when you lead by surrendering, you're still leading. And it all depends on the circumstances and leadership is not always out front. As a matter of fact, the servant leader uh, you live out in the country. You, you, you watch things. The shepherd leads the flock from the back. The shepherd does not lead the flock from the front. Okay? The, the sheep don't follow the shepherd. The she, he, he can only see. the. the how, how does he know if his back is turned to the flock? How does he know that one is missing and falling into a ditch? So leadership has a whole different meaning from a biblical perspective than what we think as the head. Uh, I tend to think of it as the chief servant, and in that chief servant model, then you take on the attributes of King David during a door, being a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord rather than sitting on the throne and emphasizing that it is the people and the service to the people. It was the Abraham getting up and serving versus Lot. You know, Abraham washed the feet where Lot said, come on in, wash your feet. You know, that, that's a huge difference in the character, and that character has to be shaped, but it's still the individual's choice. Lot had the choice by observation to have grown up near his uncle and to see his ways and to be with him in Egypt and see his ways and got attracted to what he got attracted to and went down his path. So... <clears throat> You know, the whole idea of, of Christmas, and as, as a Jew, I can tell you that the, the um, argument that I, I, and the posture I take up this time of year is I become very anti-accusing people who celebrate Christmas of being pagans. And I usually write about next week, I'll release it, it's an annual blog, <clears throat> that says that I've never met a pagan. I don't know any, I, I, I've, I've never been to a person's home that I met at church that had a tree that bowed down to the tree and paid homage to the tree. Uh, that, that this whole idea of calling anybody unbiblical, uh, it clearly states in scripture when two or more gathered in his name there, he'll be in the midst of them. Uh, if you're rolling Easter eggs, finding Easter eggs, it doesn't say, oh, because this was named after Ishtar and uh, it, chasing after eggs is a fertility rite of passage. No, Jesus says, you know what? If two or more gathered, I'll be in the midst of them. <clears throat> when I sat down at the table with the tax collectors and the thieves and the prostitutes, I, I was right there with them. I, I didn't shun them. I didn't condemn them. I fellowship with them, and they saw something unique and special. And look at Mary Magdalene, you know, what her situation was and how she was able to come to faith and be a devoted servant to the Lord, uh, not because he, was, he condemned her, not because he berated her, not because he called her, a pagan, I, I think of the woman at the well and how gentle he was by just saying, look, you Samaritans worship something you don't know. Mm -hmm. right? Yes, that was a critique, but certainly not harsh, certainly not mm -hmm. condemning, just, just stating something that was true. 
look, you don't know really what you're doing, but I'm here to tell you that what you should be doing and what you can be doing, and did it in such a way that revival broke out because of it. So we tend to take this position that, that we're this, I don't know, righteous people that should condemn others for their, uh, and, and didn't Paul write um, Galatians, Colossians, do not condemn anybody for their Sabbath worship or New Moon Festival or for any of their celebrations. Uh, this is not the role we're supposed to be in. It is just more division within the body, and it removes Christ from Christmas and puts us in there. All of a sudden, it becomes Rondimus and Stevimus and Ericamus and <laughs> It doesn't become Christmas. And uh, you just recently were at a tea with a number of, of ladies, and, and they asked you to talk. And um, this was the subject of your conversation, is that to know Christ and make him more known this Christmas, maybe different Christmas. than any other Christmas, that doesn't matter what the last 55 or 75 Christmases have been. How about devoting this Christmas to making Christ known this Christmas and to, to make it a focal point of the celebration. How you know, there's, I had so many thoughts while you were talking. Uh, we're called to be kind. We're called to be people of hospitality. This is a one time in the year where songs are being sung on secular joy to the world. The Lord has come, let earth receive her king. This is the one time of year where there is a, a sensitivity or an awareness that there is a, a Christ child. And I think that we have to step back and know that, yes, Jesus did fellowship with sinners. A lot of times when we get together with those extended family members and that one uncle comes that drinks all the time or that, you know, one cousin that's making bad decisions is there and we kind of feel like we're going to ostracize him we're judging them or we get in our car afterwards and we talk to our kids about how bad they are and how you know we would never and they should never instead of being just as real and saying no that would be us if it wasn't for Jesus that is the the evidence of Christ in us and in our family is that we don't look to those things of this world to satisfy our longings because we have found the lover of our soul, the one who created us to walk in intimacy with him and that's why Jesus came was to purchase him purchase us for himself. Let's pray for that family member who always seems to be the rub. Let's pray for that family member who never, you know, shows up on time or, or drinks too much or whatever those things are. There was always a stranger at the table for the holidays that didn't have somewhere to go. She was uh, a delightful woman and I learned about hospitality. I learned from her uh, that people are more valuable than our possessions. I learned from her the joy of the Lord that as she would bustle around the kitchen doing all of those things, I watched it. I had never seen it like that before. And our kids are watching. Uh, Steve and I do premarital counseling, and one of the first sessions he talks to them about your family of origin, your normal, what was normal to you, and how are you going to bring both of your normals together to create your own normal. And of course, the normal we want is a Christ-like, loving marriage relationship that God can use to be a light to draw others to know His Son. In fact, the most valuable evangelistic tool we have if we're married is a loving relationship with our spouse. And that begins in our homes with our children, with our extended family. But for the holidays, I think when we think about, let's just to step back a minute and talk about that tea that I had talked at uh, we um, talked, first of all, about this, this angel comes to these shepherds, and they are the most lowly, right? They are the most, you know, they need a bath. They're not someone that you would have expected to have such an honorable experience. And yet, this angel comes and tells them, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And he explains to them the Christ child has been born. And then the whole sky lights up with this host of angels, right? And then they say, let's go. And they leave their career. They leave what they were what they were doing with their time for what was more important, which was to go and seek out the Christ child. And as they go and they see him, and then it, it says after they saw him, they went away and they told everyone they met 
what they had seen and heard. And that, to me, this Christmas, if I could say any message at all, is we've had an encounter with Christ. We've seen his face when he has shined his love upon us and opened our eyes to our understanding to need to repent, to surrender to him as the Lord and Savior of our life. We've seen him. And do we walk away telling everyone that we meet, like the shepherds did, of this incredible encounter that we had with Christ that has forever changed our lives? So that is uh, just one of the points, and we can talk more about it after the break. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to take a break. We're talking with Rhonda Stoppy, the No Regrets Woman, co-host of this hour, the No Regrets Hour, where we talk about all things biblical, all things life but we specialize on living a life of no regrets, even during the holidays when many people have struggled with these issues of regret or issues of control. And we're looking to share with you ways to approach the holidays with an understanding and how we can keep Christ in Christmas or maybe even put him in the middle in the first place. And that's a part of our topic today. So we're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll revisit this subject of putting Christ back in Christmas for the No Regrets Hour with Rhonda Stoppy. We'll be right back. Shalom. I'm the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and I've got a question for you. What do you think they're doing with your DNA? Oh, you know that 23andMe kit that you sent off, and you got back that report that told you you were Irish, you were French, you were Jewish? Wonder who's interested in that information. It's not like you've sent it off to a database with millions of other people and they can steal your identity. And who would really be interested in that information other than you? Well, maybe your friends and family, but there's one, yes, one who is so interested in your DNA that it would be something that would make you afraid. And that is Satan himself. Why would Satan be interested in your DNA? Because there is a Y chromosome marker that determines whether or not you are in the line of Aaron. That's right, the biblical line of Aaron the priest. That's because if the priesthood comes back and the high priest takes his role as the head of the Sanhedrin, they will be the ones to call for the return of Jesus. Well, what can they do with your DNA? Well, there are 40-plus countries weaponizing DNA today. And imagine if Satan could weaponize your DNA and use that Y chromosome market to take out the line of the high priest, then Jesus doesn't come back. That is the plot behind the best-selling book, The Codus, now out in second edition, on Kindle, $2.99, also available in paperback. This is a biblical thriller beyond comparison that's going to take you on an incredible journey to understand what they could do with your DNA. I also want to encourage you to visit our website, ignitingandnation.com, and click on Special Offers. There you're going to find the yellow cover of this book, The Seven Laws of Abundant Living, Lessons Learned from the Tree of Life. We're going to take you on a journey in the Garden of Eden to the seed, the ground, all the way out to the fruit that reveals things of the natural that God is trying to reveal supernatural truths. Contained within these pages are seven laws and seven lessons within each law. They're going to take you on an incredible journey of understanding about the life you live and the fruit you bear. I want to encourage you to click on that yellow cover. We're going to ask for your email. Now, we won't send you spam because spam is not kosher, but we will send you the first chapter of this book. I want to encourage you to get seven laws of abundant living lessons learned from the Tree of Life. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it on Barnes & Noble. You can get it at Books A Million, wherever great Christian books are sold. Take this journey with me to the Tree of Life in the Garden of Eden and to the Tree of Life we see again at the River of Life. Get your copy today. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Rhonda Stoppy, co-author of The Marriage Mentor, author of a number of books. You've got to check her out at rhondastoppy.com. It is a wealth of resources by one of the most delightful people that I have ever met, and it is an honor that she has been with us for so long. We knew from the very first interview that uh, you were going to become a part of this family and uh, in Hebrew, it's called mishpucha. Uh, mishpucha. 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 And uh, yeah. that is uh, the highest honor we can bestow upon somebody who's not a blood relative is that you're a member of our family. And you are considered 
a member of our family. We talk about you often and uh, always look forward to our time with you and always regret, even though it's the no regrets hour, in a month we miss, <laughs> so we work on rescheduling so we never miss yes. a month with Rhonda Stoppy. Uh, Rhonda, before we went to break, we were talking about this ladies' tea that you're at, and I don't know that people realize that uh, they can go on your website and uh, they can book you. They can book you for something as, as, as uh, intimate as a ladies' tea and just have a conversation, uh, a women's event, uh, a conference, uh, lots of different things. You have a large family that you're very devoted to and make yourself very available to them. You are a faithful wife who serves alongside of her husband in both the church and the ministry, and yet you are uh, like what we consider the tall oaks of um, cedar, uh, uh, the cedars, the, I'm sorry, the cedars of Lebanon, that they go straight but not in each other's shadow. Uh, they are far enough apart that they have their own unique identity, but they're close enough together that I can use them to build a structure and they can be the corner post of that structure. And you and Steve have developed that over the years and it's quite a model and one to be respected because you each have your own identity. He's a lot more camera shy than you are. And I, uh, I just love the fact that we had him on the program and he was really great, wasn't he? He is, he's great. And you can go to my website, noregretswoman.com or rondastoppy.com, it'll both get you there. Um, and watch videos of he and I, if you click on our book, The Marriage Mentor, we did a video for each chapter of the book. They're about 15 to 20 minutes long, just chatting through. You'll feel like you're having coffee with us in our house. And uh, those are free. So anyone who's interested in building a no regrets marriage, you can watch those videos. Especially we meet people that are like, I'm not a reader. My spouse isn't a reader. It's like, start with the videos and then see if it's not just somebody. You'll just feel like you're hanging out with us even if you read the book. We wrote little gray boxes for the husbands. That's all they have to read because oftentimes the husbands are not that interested in reading. However, there's a couple reading right now that are not believers. And the young man was given the book from a friend of ours from church. And he said, I've never read a book like this that I want to keep reading. I feel like he's just talking right to me. I've never even heard these concepts before. So uh, we're delighted. I got a letter from a woman yesterday her husband is in prison and they are reading through this book together. They are both believers. And she said, it's growing our relationship. They're watching the videos separately apart together. Uh, it's, it's amazing to watch what God's doing through the marriage mentor, becoming the couple you long to be as well as our other books. But that one is the newest and uh, I'm excited about it. Right. We can also send them if they want an overview of just that dialogue and that conversation, they can go to the Igniting Nation YouTube channel and pull up the Rhonda Stoppy Marriage Mentor interview with Steve Stoppy's cameo, one hour cameo appearance, where we got him <laughs> to sit down and actually get in front of the camera, which he doesn't often do in the public setting, uh, other than behind the pulpit. Uh, he's right. he, he likes that one-on-one -on -one and lets you sit in front of the camera but uh, he likes to be in the background. Yes, and that's a fun interview. Yeah, we laughed a lot, remember? We did. We <laughs> that's a good one. We, we laughed a lot. We, um, I think he was as surprised as how well we knew him uh, <laughs> after, not even, <laughs> after never having met him. Uh, the, yes. The, 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 <laughs> it, it, you know, like he was looking around for cameras and listening devices in the home to see whether or not we, <laughs> ha we, had, you, we had you bugged. So going, going back, back to this tea, um, so how did this develop? How did the conversation start and where did you go with it? Well, you know, I, I began talking about Mary. Uh, so many people want to want to escalate Mary to be someone other than just a, a woman that found favor with God. Uh, the angel that came to Mary and said, oh, you are highly favored. And, you know, any one of us in Christ, God says we're highly favored. And God says in Ephesians, he saves us to good works. He ordains in advance that we should walk in them. He chose Mary in her generation for the purpose that he created her for, which was to be the mother of the Christ child. And this young girl, probably a teenager, had, number one, she recognized God. She knew 
uh, scripture. She knew the prophecy that a virgin would bear a son and it would be the Messiah. So she wasn't shocked or surprised by this message. She was surprised they were asking that God was asking her, but the message itself, she was already familiar with truth. So truth resonated with her when this angel approached her. Uh, and then a lot of times what I'll talk about when I'm talking about Mary in the situation is her life was pure. She was a virgin. She was somebody that God could entrust with this ministry. And in our culture in this day and age, uh, women that are single, even young as, as teenagers, virginity is something that is just so not even maybe even looked down upon. It's just something that is just not very valuable. And yet in my book, Real Life Romance, I celebrate the romance of individuals that honored Christ in their relationship, that waited on the Lord to bring a spouse. Here's the thing. If you you're dating someone and you're sleeping with them and you're trying to discern if this is someone that you should marry, you can't even discern with the spirit of the most high God indwelling you, giving you wisdom for that lifelong decision. If you're in sin, you're quenching the spirit in your life. So Mary was walking in purity. She had to weigh out as a teenage girl what this was going to cost her. Would Joseph believe her? Would anyone believe her? And then at the very end of when she finally responds, she just says, let it be as it, as it unto me. I, I love that. Um, I love Mary's prayer. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. And then she says, for he who has mighty, who is mighty has done great things for me. Holy is his name. I pray that prayer often before I get out of bed in the morning. Because any one of us who have been rescued from our sin, we have to stop and say, wow, why me? Why me? He who is mighty has done great things for me. Holy is his name. And then when we go to look at what happened with Mary, I love that she had a choice to make. And she made the choice to obey. God didn't tell her go ahead and trust me because I'm going to give a dream to Joseph and he's going to believe and go ahead and trust me because blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. He just put her at a crossroad, a, a, a crisis of belief, if you will. And she chose to honor God and obey him and leave the details to God. You know, and so when she did that, then I love that God sends her to an older woman, a mentor, a cousin, Elizabeth, who's pregnant with John the Baptist. And the spirit leaps within John the Baptist in the womb of his mother, and Elizabeth, as she walks in, she says, you are pregnant with the Messiah. Uh, mentors are amazing uh, resources in our lives. As younger, older, wherever we're at, there's always someone to be mentored. There's always someone to look for to mentor us. Uh, and when we do that, God pours courage into us to walk the path that he calls us to because it's not easy usually when he calls us to something it's not the easy path it's not the path uh, without a, a lot of effort a lot of work a lot of people thinking you're crazy and they don't understand why you're doing what you're doing so just having one person in your life pour truth into you is so encouraging as it was for elizabeth and mary you know for mary the historical context of a jewish woman who was betrothed, the families had made the arrangements, and there was an expectation that, uh, and, and a warranty, if you will, <clears throat> that the marital bed would be the first place in which the woman would uh, have her first marital relations. And there were provisions within the law that if there was evidence that that was not the case, that uh, there was a problem to be resolved and there was physical evidence and it was the sheet, the marital sheet from the wedding bed. So here a message is delivered that is so contrary to the culture, to the law of Moses, to the world that they lived in, to all the social mores, to all the political mores, to all the legal and religious mores and all the family values that a message was being given to her. And she, by faith, accepted the message and did not resist the message and trusted in the Lord to the point of shedding all the things that keep us held back. What will my mother think? What will my father think? What will the neighbors think? What will the community think? What will happen when they find out that I'm pregnant and I am not married and this man is still willing to accept me and that too is entirely antithetical to the Jewish culture and the Jewish world 
that he would accept that. Today, you might accept that. That might be more commonplace in a more liberal society. This was not a liberal society. This was a conservative, biblical, Torah-bound under the law of Moses. This is a huge leap. It is not the diminished Oh, well, the, Gabriel spoke to her and told her she would be a child. She's like, okay, yeah, I'll go along with this. No, this is the count, this count the greatest cost of all cost, that this was going to be the scandal. The families were going to be scandalized that there was going to, they were going to bring on, I, I can tell you that the father would have rent his garment, that he would have gone into mourning. He would have mourned the death of his daughter. He, they would have put her out. She would have had no place in the community. She would have been welcomed nowhere. And we have so diminished this calling on Mary, so diminished from a cultural and religious and spiritual background that she was willing to count the cost, knowing the cost was so severe. We think of the scarlet letter. We think of a of, uh, young pregnant woman today. We go back to my era in the 50s where um, uh, you pulled a pregnant girl out of high school. She didn't go to high school pregnant. She was shipped off to some nunnery somewhere and all of a sudden disappeared for years. Nobody knew that she was pregnant. Imagine 2,000 years ago what it would have been like. She would have been stoned to death and she knew the price mm -hmm. she had to pay but yet she was willing and she did it with grace and she did it with faith and we take it so for granted Rhonda this calling on Mary and the price she had to be willing to pay and we as, belie we, we, yeah, we as believers don't count the cost I, I as a Jew had to be willing to lose 14 million relatives to accept Jesus as my Messiah. I know what it's like to count the cost, but the average Protestant, the average evangelical knows nothing, nothing. It is every day, it is commonplace, and we have diminished it to the point where we ignore this mantle which was placed upon two individuals, Mary, independent of Joseph, and Joseph, independent of Mary, two people who so fulfilled the prophecy of Amos, can two walk together lest they be in agreement. They were both in relationship with the Lord and heard the voice of the angel, and they believed, knowing that whatever the world thought, they didn't care. How many of us are willing to answer that call, and how big a call was that, that it brought us right. the Messiah? And that brought me to tears just thinking of this teenage girl knowing all of that was in front of her if she said yes to the Lord. And I think that's our crisis of belief. God calls us, uh, maybe it's out of a, a dating relationship that isn't honoring to the Lord. And you're just like, what will I do? Where will I live? Where will I go? We're living together. Uh, it's a crisis of belief to trust and say, I will obey God no matter what it costs me. I am your servant. I can do no otherwise. And we have to look at God's character, which is revealed all through the Old Testament. He so gives us glimpses of how he works among his people so that we know his character. We know his hand in our own lives. We know to trust him. And it's so interesting. Number one, the angel came to Mary when she was alone and spoke to her when she was alone. And she came to her own decision alone. And then she tells Joseph, who does not believe her, God could have given Joseph the dream at the same time he was speaking to Mary so that there was no moment of, of uh, him questioning her. But in God's timing, he allowed that time in between. Mary went off to be with Elizabeth, and then God visited Joseph and said, this child is of the Lord, and, and take her to be your wife. God's timing doesn't always look like what we would like. He allows us to be refined by fire. He was refining the character of the man who would be the earthly father of Messiah, of his son. And part of that refining oftentimes just makes us uncomfortable, makes us feel uh, like what, what could possibly good could come of this. And the kindness of Joseph comes out when we see that it says he wanted to put her away quietly. 
uh, he was a kind man, talking about leading from kindness. He was a kind man. He loved this woman. He was devastated at the news, but it wasn't until God let him process all of that, his character comes forth as this kind man, and then God visits him and says, take Mary as your wife. And so he does, and I'm, I'm sure there was scandal and talks and sideways looks, and you know, they're, they're just people that even in Jesus' time were saying, oh, you know, hmm, yeah, we know where you came from. But God was glorified in their obedience. And then they have this baby, and then, you know, I love what's going on in the politics is ridiculously uh, pointing toward the second coming of our Messiah. And people are up in arms, what's going to happen? Oh, no, oh, no. But just like God so divinely orchestrated politics at the time so that Mary and Joseph would have to go back to Bethlehem to be counted, to pay their taxes, and all those things that had to happen— he orchestrated that Jesus would be born in the town that it was prophesied. And then he let him be born in a barn. He didn't let him be born even in a house with a bed. It was the most lowly entrance into this world that God chose for his son. And then when they take the baby and they go in to have him circumcised, I love Simeon, who this older man scoops up this child and he says, I've seen the consolation of Israel. Now I can die. Basically, God had promised him he wasn't going to die until he saw Messiah. And in that moment, I love, again, God's providence and sovereignty, his timing. In that moment, Anna, who had lived in the temple, who had been widowed for like 84 years, had no children. At that very moment, she happens by to hear her buddy Simeon saying, this is the Christ child. And of course, Simeon also looks at Mary and he says, your heart's going to be pierced through with sorrow. Even in that, God started preparing Mary. This child is going to, is going to die. This, this, this grief is something you're going to just have to know. Did she think of that when she was standing at the foot of the cross? Did Simeon's words come back to comfort her at that time? I don't know. But I love that after Anna spent that one encounter with Jesus, the Bible says she went and told everyone that she had heard, everyone that she had seen the Messiah. Again, in this Christmas season, are we willing to tell everyone we've seen Messiah? He changed my life. My encounter with him forever took my heart of stone and was replaced with a heart of flesh. He wrote his statutes on my heart. He causes me to walk in his ways. He gives me the will to do what he calls me to do. There's purpose in life. There's joy beyond measure because he is my king, because the Christ child has grown and lived and died and purchased me for himself. And then the final point is the angels. You know, they glory to God in the highest. In Revelation, I think it's in Revelation 5, it talks about around the throne, the throne where they're looking at Jesus, the Messiah, and they're saying, who will take the scroll? You're worthy. And I love this line. It says, for with your blood, you purchase men for God from every tribe, from every tongue, from every nation. The angels, Peter says, they, they long to understand our redemption. They, they long, I was trying to find where it's at. It's in First Peter. They, they long to understand that the king of heaven made himself vulnerable to his creation. And even when Jesus, you know, when Peter cut off the ear and was going to fight to save Jesus, and he put the ear back, he's like, Peter, don't you know that I could call, ask my father right now to send a legion of, of angels? And this wouldn't happen. And I think just the angels of heaven knew we can rescue him. And watching God allow mere creation to not just hang him on a cross, but abuse him, beat him so he didn't even look like a man before they put him on a cross. And this host of heaven that would protect him from any of that, God held back. He held them back. And he allowed Jesus' blood to be spilt to purchase you and I as the treasure of our king, as the bride of Christ. Uh, that should, We should never lose the awe of that. And we do. And we need to ask God to light a new flame in us. Like Anna, the encounter with him. I don't care how old we are or how young we are, Mary, a teenager. When my encounter with Christ, it needs to change me forever. And I need to ask God, give me that zeal. Give me that urgency to make Christ known in this generation. And especially at Christmas time, when the, there's talk of the Christ child, there's talk of redemption of, of angels, and then not let it just be commonplace. Tell it to our children in a new and fresh way and make Christ known this Christmas. Ask God, help me make Christ known this Christmas. And that is the call for each one of us, that we would use this season 
the season where we celebrate the birth of Messiah. Not that the Bible commands us to celebrate it, therefore we do it of our own volition in order to edify, in order to uplift, in order to celebrate the birth of the greatest miracle man has ever known, the one who brought us the plan of salvation of a loving father who is willing to sacrifice his only son. If this can be a day, a time, a season where we put Christ back into Christmas, the challenge for each one of us is to take ourselves out of the equation and put him at the forefront. Then your festivities, your holiday celebration, your heart will change and that will set the course for the remainder of this year and all the years to come. It's a great place to start by putting Christ back in Christmas. Rhonda Stoppe, the No Regrets Woman, you are a blessing to us. We wish your family a happy Hanukkah, a Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year, and we look forward to seeing you on January the 16th at a special day and time due to scheduling conflicts. But we will see you then, and until we see you, we uh, just send you our love and blessings for you and your entire family for this year and for every year to come. Thank you. And if you could keep in mind your audience to be praying for my friend Heather Lee. Her husband is a pastor of a Messianic Jewish congregation in Paradise, California, which is near where we live. 90% of that town burned in the California fires. Their church did not burn down. She said the grass is even still green. Uh, they lost their home, and a lot of their church members have moved away to find some sort of housing. They are in dire need of uh, finances, of people to help come alongside of them in their church. Her father-in-law just quit his job to come be with her uh, husband so he can help him run the church and get it back in order. But prayers appreciated for California and specifically for Heather Lee and her husband and their ministry there in paradise. Amen and amen. Rhonda Stoppe, the No Regrets Woman. Find her at rondastoppe.com or noregretswoman.com. And we just bless you abundantly and thank you so much for being a part of our family. We're going to take a short break. And when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.